Okay, so um, we have our panelists with us. We are good to go. Over to you. Thanks very much, Robin. Well, good morning. Um, we're delighted to be joining you virtually in Glasgow for this day focused on education and climate. Thank you very much for having us. Um, so we're going to um, share these screens, which means that um, Lizzie Rushton, who uh, has co-led the manifesto it from King's, might be appearing as a disembodied voice. So Lizzie, do you want to say hello? Hello and good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, so yeah, a warm welcome from both of us. I'm Linda Dunlop from the University of York. And over the past year or so, Lizzie and I have been working with teachers and young people from England, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales to set out a manifesto for education for environmental sustainability, which attends to the calls from teachers and students alike for educational responses to the climate change. So the manifesto that we're going to be talking about is a product of the 2021 Research Commission from the British Educational Research Association. Um, we've been working with a wide range of partners, experts in environmental education, teachers and young people to come up with the proposals in the manifesto. Now, our focus has been on secondary or high school um, students in the UK and teachers in the UK, but we believe we've got something interesting to say for um, audience elsewhere in other stages in terms of both the processes that we've used and the sorts of things that teachers and young people are calling for. So. <clears throat> Much of the work in this area is focused on the interests of either teachers or young people. Um, but as we say, we've brought teachers and young people's perspectives together through a series of futures workshops and visualization workshops to understand each other and share priority actions for education. So these um, approaches are consistent with the UN Sustainability Development Goals 13.3, the target to um, improve education, awareness raising and human and institutional capacity for action on climate change. Um, all of the young people um, that we've worked with were of high school age, age 16 to 18, because they've just completed their secondary education, their compulsory education, and can reflect on what was there, what wasn't there, and how sustainability featured in that. So the result of this work with over 200 participants is an illustrated manifesto, um, which if you can see and scan the QR that could that will take you directly to a link where you can download it. All of the um, the images that Lizzie will share um, later are in this manifesto. So environmental sustainability is kind of a it's a term that means many things to different people. The definition that we've used is that that came out of our discussions with participants. So they talked about sustainability as a process of both care and repair of the environment, which involves um, addressing environmental but also social injustices and the need to consider future generations as a matter of priority. And I think it's really important um, from this work that education for environmental sustainability is not seen as a choice and teachers and young people alike were talking about the need for collective action um, when and um, suggesting some practical ways of making this happen. So Robin has primed you um, for some interactivity. So at this point, I'd like to invite you to think about your own education for environmental sustainability um, and just say three words that you would use to describe it. Um, if you go to menti.com and enter the number 95418389 or scan the QR code, um, we'll be able to see um, a cloud of responses based on the audience that we have here. And hopefully my technology is not going to fail me as I go to show you the results of this. So let's see. Okay, and that seems to have worked lovely. So. What do we have here? <clears throat> so yeah, important, empowering, urgent seem to be quite big themes with this um, audience. Um, inspiring, 
essential, needs to be empowering. And these are themes that I think Lizzie will return to later as she um, describes some of the um, findings from our research that has created the, the manifesto. Um, Okay, I'm going to switch back now um, to tell you a little bit about the process that we have used in terms of, um, of a kind of journey over the past year and on this work. So the illustrated manifesto is the result of the analysis of workshop contributions of over 200 young people and teachers. And this is the path that we took to producing the um, the manifesto. First, we engaged partners, some of whom are with you in Glasgow, so um, especially those partners with a focus on inclusivity. Jane Essex of the University of Strathclyde has expertise in working with young people with additional learning needs, and Judy Ling Wong of the Black Environment Network both helped us to ensure that the manifesto making process was inclusive. Then we designed um, workshops with um, our partners. So Sirius Nairi of Roots Journal hosted provocations from leaders in research and practice on sustainability education, which we used to stimulate thinking in advance of the future's workshops with teachers and young people. Um, again, we'll show you an example of a provocation in a moment, and you can look at those um, after our session. Um, and Amanda Smith of the Centre for Alternative Technology and Andrea Bullivant and Jackie Airy of Liverpool World Centre co-designed and facilitated the Futures workshops. So we hosted seven of those, plus provided alternative ways of contributing, each lasting two hours with a focus on how um, young people and teachers thought um, things are at the moment, where we need to be, and how we might get there. We then analysed um, these workshop contributions with um, a group of research assistants, Lucy Atkinson, Laura Price, Mridhi Safaya, Josh Stubbs, Maria Turkeberg van Diepen, and Lucy Wood. And then from the analysis, um, Maisie Summer and Laura Price facilitated visualization workshops, which put all of those ideas into images. And the final um, manifesto then has been illustrated by Maisie Summer and hopefully you can see um, a self-portrait of her on the right. Um, so that's almost all from me um, but before Lizzie picks up to tell you um, about the messages from the manifesto we'd like to share one of the provocations with you. So this was contributed by Molly Hucker again who's in Glasgow this week. Molly's a climate activist from Wales um, and we'd like to just share her ideas from our starting point. So here we go. Um, be able to see this. Hello, my name is Molly. I'm a climate activist from South Wales. I think schools could be a massive solution to the climate emergency. Hopefully I'm about to show you why. So currently in schools, we see climate change and global warming being taught in science and geography. But by confining the climate emergency to these two subjects, we sort of portrayed the climate emergency as like a distant threat. We need to worry about that. Whereas a cross curriculum approach could really be a solution and help convey how the climate emergency really transcends every aspect of our lives. This could be done through having discussions in almost every um, subject. For example, in sociology, you could talk about climate justice. In ICT and DT, we could have discussions on green technologies. But it doesn't stop there. We also need to take the climate emergency outside of the classroom too, with an entire school approach to teaching and raising awareness of the climate emergency. Canteens could boast a plant-based menu, raising awareness of the detrimental environmental impacts of meat consumption. Schools should include local green spaces, for example, even having their own allotment, not only teaching the worth of local produce and growing our own food and sustainability of food production, but also helping fight holiday hunger and connect the school community firsthand to the nature that is so worth protecting. We know that green spaces can have positive mental health impacts, for example, reducing stress. 
and we all know how stressful schools can be. We can also look to seek to locate schools on green pathways, for example, cycle routes, easily accessible by foot, reducing the need to congest the roads with cars to get to and from schools, making our roads safer around schools as well. Schools could be thinking about how the carbon footprint is contributed through uniforms. What is the process of the school uniform? How ethical is it? How water intensive was the production? Schools could advocate for the recycling of school uniforms from year group to year group, passing school uniforms down, saving and reducing the school's carbon footprint. Schools really do have the opportunity to take an entire school approach to tackling the climate emergency. Instilling the climate conscious habits, teaching the climate emergency in a way that isn't scary or overwhelming, but honest and conveys the severity of the problem, but justifies this by saying what we can do to combat the climate emergency. Thank you. Um, so I just before I hand over to Lizzie, want to thank Molly again for her contributions and invite you to um, visit the Roots webpage where you can find Molly's um, provocation along with others um, in environmental education research and practice. Lizzie, then, can I hand over to you? You can. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, so we have another question to ask you, and perhaps having heard uh, Molly's um, provocation, this, this may shape your responses, but how optimistic do you feel about the role of schools in promoting education for environmental sustainability? So if we can ask you to go um, back to Menti, hopefully you haven't shut that down, and it's the same code, the same place, and pop some words in response to that question. Bye. Go on. Fantastic. So I might say that that might be the Molly effect, um, having listened to uh, Molly and um, her perspectives and her um, vision. I think perhaps that places us in a really good position for thinking about schools and their role um, in education for environmental sustainability. So thank you very much for that, Linda. Please, may we go back to the slides? Thank you. So as Linda has said um, and set out really um, nicely for us, the manifesto is a project with many, many wonderful partners and myself and Linda here are speaking and sharing this on behalf of a huge team of people who've been working in this area, some of them for many, many decades, and, and our work would not be the same without their inclusion. Um, we've Principally, we've worked with school um, students and their teachers, um, and people have been able to contribute at different stages of the project um, and in different ways, as you've seen through the provocations, through um, supporting our workshops and through working with different groups to em enable different voices to be heard. And as, and as we've set out, we were really keen that the manifesto captured perspectives from across England, Scotland, Wales uh, and Northern Ireland, each with their different contexts and um, histories and geographies. And by working with um, experts and in inclusion of young people with additional learning needs and with the Black Environment Network, we were so keen to include the voices of people less frequently heard in the context of education for environment sustainability. And Linda has highlighted the um, provocations and the, the Roots Journal website. And there are videos, there are short written responses across a series of, of provocations and stimulus material that speak to um, some distinct themes. So we have a collection that focus on young leaders of collective action for the climate. Um, we've got a, a series that look at intergenerational conversations about the climate. Another strand looks at local and global bridges to an interconnected world. And then finally, a series that draws perspectives from research, from practitioners and from teachers. 
Um, and these resources are all freely available on the project page um, via the Roots Journal website. And we do encourage you to use them in your own work to perhaps begin, continue um, conversations about education for environmental sustainability in your own context and in your own communities. Co-creation um, is at the heart of uh, the Manifesto project and we as a research team, as we've said, have brought people together um, from, with different ideas and different perspectives from different geographical contexts and across different generations. And the Manifesto really represents the visions and conversations of the young people and teachers that we've worked with for over the, uh, the last year. Underpinning our work is the recognition, as I've said, that conversations about environmental sustainability frequently do not include the voices um, of a diverse set of perspectives. We see this, for example, in the way some individuals and communities are included in images and conversations about climate change, whilst others are overlooked or even deliberately excluded. At every stage of this project, we've reflected with our partners um, across a series of questions, which include whose voices are being heard? How can we make space for different voices? Have we listened to those with whom we might disagree? And whilst we do not claim um, for a moment that our work is perfect, we are heartened by the feedback from those who've journeyed with us through this project. As one young person said to us following our launch of the manifesto on Monday, um, I feel that young, person, young people's voices have genuinely been incorporated at every level of the creation of the manifesto, collecting many different perspectives. I wish this manifesto was in place when I was at school. As Linda has said, the co-production of the manifesto has included a series of online workshops where we discuss the barriers, the solutions and the pathways towards the future we would like for environmental sustainability education. Through the guidance of our artist partners, we've literally been able to draw the future that we would like to see. And I'm now going to highlight some of the ideas, proposals and suggestions that are presented in the manifesto. The profound disconnects between people in different generations and living in different parts of the planet is acutely visible in the tension and conflict that surround discourses concerning climate change and environmental sustainability. Young people are frequently at the forefront of social movements that call for greater climate justice and adequate education for environmental sustainability. They demand action and change from the generations before them who have the power to implement such change. Yet youth are frequently underrepresented in climate and environmental policy making. As Linda has said, providing a space for young people and teachers to come together to co-create a shared vision for education for environmental sustainability is a central part of this project. Therefore, recognising the need to bridge these divides at the outset of co-creating the manifesto, we articulated the values that we share and the capabilities that we need. These values include love for each other and for the planet, respect and compassion for others, honesty, humility and cooperation, social justice, equitable opportunities for all, connection with nature, wisdom, positivity, adaptability, practicality and pragmatism. Viewed in terms of capabilities, education's core purpose can be understood as being to develop capabilities for living well with all species on earth and education's outcomes are seeking that participants develop capabilities for fostering just change. The capabilities that young people and teachers identified as needing in the context of education for environmental sustainability include critical thinking, questioning, data literacy, research, innovation, creativity, communication and networking. A key point to note here is that teachers and young people alike see knowledge as necessary but not sufficient for education for environmental sustainability. This resonates with the work and ideas of academics, for example, Roussel and Cutter Mackenzie Knowles, who in 2019 argued that didactic approaches to climate change education have been largely ineffective and argue that there is a need, and I quote, to stop shying away from the Earth's looming runaway climate change. They call for educators to seize the moment and to examine what really matters through participatory, interdisciplinary, creative and affect driven approaches to climate change education, which involve young people in responding to the scientific, social, ethical and political complexities of climate change. In our work for this project, we were very much alive to this call and this approach. 
We co-created the workshops with our partners to create spaces where young people and teachers were encouraged to think about their own freedom and autonomy to take action, to use their imagination, to identify and consider their choices on how to live in relation to environmental sustainability, and to do that as a part of a dialogue with others, where different perspectives and experiences were shared and valued, where difference was seen as a positive resource and not a barrier to be overcome. Throughout the manifesto, youth and teachers have identified solutions at different levels for the classroom, the school, community and at policy level. And I'll briefly draw attention to some of the ideas from each of these facets. So we'll start with the classroom. A central message from a classroom perspective is that students and teachers want more time and space to learn about climate change and environmental sustainability in a way that is not linked to assessment and which encourages students to research and take action in the context of sustainability. Simply knowing more is not enough. Young people and teachers want opportunities to act for the environment. Young people and teachers recognise that in secondary or high school, they mainly learn about environmental sustainability and climate change in science and geography lessons. This was seen as problematic as it restricts its opportunities that students have to learn about these topics and, the, and ideas as they get older. Young people and teachers call for more support for teachers of all subjects so that they are all able to engage in sustainability focused professional development to build their confidence. And that this could mean that environmental sustainability was a thread that ran through all subjects, for example, art, maths, music, history and so on. We see this in the image of a sustainability classroom with views across the school greenhouse and allotments, opportunities and time for students to work together and to make sustainable choices and take sustainable action. And we'll move on to the school. Teachers and young people want to place student voice and agency at the core of school sustainability action, where making the sustainable choice in school is straightforward and where sustainability is considered in all purchasing decisions. Sustainability actions should be tracked and rewarded. Sustainability should feature in school level decision making bodies and policies. And there should be a school sustainability lead who coordinates and enables sustainability work across the school so that it is integral to school life and valued as such. Teachers and young people call for the link between the quality of the school environment and their mental and physical health to be acknowledged and nurtured. They drew the school sites and buildings that they would like to learn in. And we see this in the image of a green school environment with, for example, sustainable transport and energy options. And we'll now look at the community level. Education for environmental sustainability was seen as a community endeavor by teachers and young people. They called for a no cost externally accredited award for students and teachers which has an environmental sustainability focus and which had value for them, perhaps in how it might contribute to their future university or job applications. Both teachers and young people highlight the value of the collective and how this develops over time. During the workshops with Maisie and Laura, this idea was visualized through the example of an acorn, which grows into a sapling and then a mature oak tree and eventually into a forest, a community of sustainability, if you will. Youth and teachers want to see a community sustainability curriculum for groups and parents involved in education, and they want to, opportunities to identify and value sustainability education undertaken from the early years onwards and build on this work through community based partnerships in both formal and informal education settings. Teachers and young people want to see greater awareness of the value of schools as local hubs for sustainability where people from across the community can take part in and lead education and activities and build networks. This sense of a school as the community sustainability hub is beautifully captured in this illustration with shared opportunities to work, learn and live sustainably. And we'll move on to our fourth level policy level. At the policy level, the manifesto calls for a coordinated review involving teachers and students of secondary or high school curricula across the UK. The aim is to identify ways to foreground and value sustainability, regardless of the subjects which students elect to study. 
teachers and students would like to work with policymakers to identify ways that sustainability can feature in existing accountability regimes and policies. They would like to see educational policies which focus on valuing collective equitable action and positive problem solving. Young people and teachers would like the recognition and endorsement of respected people and groups. For example, politicians, social media influencers and prominent and visible people in society and culture. Across all levels, including the classroom, the school, the community and at policy level, the importance of starting young with sustainability was recognised. As our participants put it, start young and keep going. And we'll move to our next slide. At this point, I would like to thank, um, on behalf of myself and Linda and the whole research team, um, extend our huge thanks to the young people and teachers who've created this compelling and inspiring vision, to Maisie for so beautifully illustrating that vision, and to our partners and colleagues who've supported this project, especially our funder Bira. In our ongoing work, we're hosting an online artist-led workshop on the 30th of November as part of the ESRC's Festival of Social Sciences, and that will be again with Maisie, Laura, and our colleague Meryl Batchelder. In this workshop, we'll be bringing together those with an interest in environmental education to share ways about how to implement simple ideas into everyday practice in and beyond schools, and all are very welcome. So do watch out for more information about that. The Research Commission is also guest editing an issue of Beera's Research Intelligence publication, which will have contributions from across the Research Commission, and that will be published early next year. And we're of course working on um, some research articles focused on the manifesto, which we hope will be published in the very near future. We would be delighted to hear your responses to the manifesto, to the ideas and proposals that resonate with you and your context and your communities, the aspects that prompt questions and further thinking. Perhaps you might be inspired to pledge action on education for environmental sustainability in your own context or even develop similar projects and action. Please do get in touch. We would be very pleased to continue the conversation. And I'll now hand back to Linda. Uh, thanks, Lizzie. Um, it just remains for me um, to say again an enormous thank you to the work of our partners in bringing together all of the teachers and young people who contributed to the manifesto. Um, these are some of the organisations that we have worked with throughout the manifesto making process. And these are the individuals that we've mentioned in various places in terms of their role in producing the manifesto. So I think now we're going to hand over to Robin to chair some questions. Um, I'm just going to leave these questions that we've already been asked um, on, on the slide, but we'd be delighted to have any questions um, from the floor. Um, and from you. So thank you very much again for hosting us. Okay, everybody. So I think what we might have to do here is relay this a little bit. So if anyone in the audience has a question, if you can pop your hand up and if you can't hear us online, I will tell you what the question is. Hope that works for you. Sounds good. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Thank you very much for that uh, great presentation. I uh, like the question that's up there and I was thinking the same thing. If we wanna take this home and do it ourselves, what would be like the three first steps that you would uh, suggest or something of that sort um, so we could do something similar? Um, I, shall, shall I go first, Lizzie, and then <laughs> maybe? I can give the first step and then maybe okay. the second step. For me. I mean, the first step I would suggest is um, really think about the partners that you want to work with in this work so that you can, you know, no one um, can do this alone. This has to be a collaborative endeavour if we really want to reach diverse perspectives. So think about the partners that you can work with um, um, to bring together that kind of work. So, and, and, and also encourage everyone who does this work to really... Um, challenge themselves, you know, not just at the beginning, but at every stage, have we really included the voices of people that are less frequently heard? Um, do we have those perspectives in the work that we do? So that's, that would be my starting point, Linda, what would you add? 
Yeah, I, well, I totally agree with that. And I think having those partners throughout so that they can ask the difficult questions at each stage and you're able to respond to the sorts of things that they're telling you. I mean, certainly that, that happened during our process. And I think the, the other key thing is creating um, those spaces for people to talk. So I think we've all become quite used to showing up in, in Zoom places and listening to what um, other people you know, someone is telling us, whereas um, I think creating those open spaces where the bulk of the time is spent listening to the people's perspectives that you want to include. So in our case, teachers and young people, we, we provided a, a series of prompts, but the majority of the time we spent was hearing um, different perspectives and you know, prompting and probing in relation to those perspectives. Do we have any more questions from the floor? No. Well, if I can ask one. Um, I've been fascinated by the work that you've been doing, and it's really interesting to see how this has unfolded. So we've been talking a lot about optimism and climate anxiety already today. It's, it's something of a developing theme, and we've already had our poll. I just wondered if I could ask both of you, how, how did it affect you as you progressed through the work? Did you, you know, see a difference in your own attitude and positivity towards what we might be able to do in education? I mean, I'll, I'll go first on that. I think you can't fail when you work with young people to not feel optimistic and to not feel hopeful and encouraged. Um, it's just a huge privilege of being in education um, that, that, that there is that hope. Um, there is that, coupled with that, that sense of real responsibility that as someone from a different generation, you know, that we're part of the problem as well as part of the solution. So there is that kind of tension there between feeling very hopeful about the future when young people are in part of the conversation, but also feeling that responsibility that, you know, asking oneself, have I, have I done enough? Um, and what can I do in the future? Um, yeah, I, I totally agree with um, what Lizzie said. Um, and I think the, the other thing where I think there's room for optimism is that there's not a shortage of ideas about ways of achieving this. There's not a shortage of will amongst teachers or young people. So there's a lot of impetus to make the changes that are needed and to act together and push for the, the sorts of policies that are going to support that sort of action. So I think in that sense, um, there is some optimism around what we can do in education. Okay, well, I think that's us for the questions for the time being. So I just want to thank you both so much, um, Lizzie and Linda, for the work you've done, the presentation you've shared today. And I would encourage everybody here in the room and at home to have a look at the work that's been done by the Journals Project and the Manifesto and to share that as widely as we can. It's a really practical thing, lots of solutions to the problems that we're currently discussing. So thank you so much for working with us today.